Well, the last two Sundays found us in the book of Acts, featuring the tales of some of the early church leaders. Today marks the start of a three-week jaunt through the letter to the Romans. We're not going to cover everything, of course, uh, but we'll spend some time there. And so given that, I'm going to use the bulk of today's message as an introduction to this letter and its role within the canon of Scripture. Of the 27 books in the New Testament, 14 have traditionally been attributed to the great missionary Paul of Tarsus, though it is incorrect to refer to them as books at all. They're letters or fragments of letters addressed to a given individual or community. If you were to scan the table of contents, and actually I'm looking to see, grab, like grab a pew Bible, uh, turn to the table of contents. Um, I mean, this part will mean more to you if you've got that in front of you. I'm going to do it too, don't worry. Okay, so there you can see the New Testament laid out. If you were to scan the table of contents in your Bible, you will notice that it has been arranged in blocks. The first being the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, followed by these 14 letters, separated actually into three groups. Uh, and then we get into some other stuff. And Revelation, that's fun. Uh, so we've got the nine letters addressed to communities or to congregations. Then there's four letters addressed to individuals. And then there's a letter to the Hebrews. And then similar to what we find, it's interesting, Heather, that you mentioned it reminded you of the Old Testament because they're actually uh, laid out in here in a similar fashion. That is, uh, like the prophetic books in the Old Testament, uh, the letters are or uh, organized according to length, not chronology. So biggest to smallest. So we get Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, Titus, Philemon, and Hebrews. Modern scholars agree with the traditional 2nd century Christian belief that seven of these 14 letters were almost certainly written by Paul himself. 1st Thessalonians, Galatians, Philippians, Philemon, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, and Romans. The others were likely written in his name, by his students and disciples. These set, see, and when we go to dinner church on Wednesday, you can ask me, how did they figure that out? And I would love to have that conversation with you. So, see you Wednesday. These seven letters were most likely written during the height of Paul's missionary activity, somewhere between year 50 and 58, uh, common era, making them the earliest, this is really neat, the earliest surviving Christian documents. In fact, they predate the earliest of the Gospels, the Gospel of Mark, by at least 10 years. Consider that. Right? You had letters, emails, whatever, correspondence, being written between budding Christian communities before there was even a written Gospel. That's mind-blowing. All they had to go off of was the Hebrew scriptures and the verbal accounts of some itinerant preachers that couldn't even agree on what was happening. During the winter of 57 to 58 common era, Paul was in the Greek city of Corinth. From Corinth, he wrote the longest single letter in the New Testament, which he addressed to God's beloved in Rome. Interestingly, while Paul's letters tended to be written in response to specific crises, the letter to the Romans lacks the specificity. Oh, I should not do this to myself. Uh, addressing broad questions of theology rather than specific questions of contemporary practice. By way of example, uh, 1 Corinthians was written to admonish the Christian community in Corinth for its internal divisions. Quit bickering amongst yourselves, Paul says, and for its immoral sexual practices. Well, we'll leave that for a summer series. There is no such direct indictment in the letter to the church in Rome. Furthermore, while the other letters are filled with impassioned rhetoric and personal pleas, downright aggression when you read the letter to the Galatians, 
The letter to the Romans takes a solemn and restrained tone not found in Paul's other letters. There's some debate that the reason for this shift in tone can be explained by timing. Paul's nearing the end of his ministry by this point, and there's a sageness that comes with time and wisdom, so I've been told. Although being listed in our Bibles first after the book of Acts, the letter to the Romans was actually the last of the seven New Testament letters that modern scholars attribute to Paul. Thus, it contains a summary of Paul's thoughts and reflections composed as his career moved towards its conclusion. There's a reflective quality and a warmth not seen in other letters written by Paul. One final feature, there will be a test we're teaching today, one final feature that makes the letter to the Romans unique to its counterparts is that it was written to a church that was not actually founded by Paul. In fact, at the time he wrote the letter to the Romans, Paul had never even been to Rome. At best, chapter 16 indicates he had some friends there, some acquaintances. And so unlike letters like those written to the church in Corinth, here Paul is writing to a community largely composed of strangers. And yet, they aren't really strangers, are they? Because there's some kind of deep connection to one another through the love and salvation of Christ. Something that transcends knowing each other by name and face. More on that in a second. So Paul begins his letter with arguably the longest salutation ever. And um, just fun fact. In Koine Greek, there, is, there aren't like periods and commas. Uh, you can't tell where one sentence ends and one begins. You just have to sort of guess. So you have to imagine the long run-on sentences that happen in Paul's letters. And in fact, if you pick up different translations of the New Testament, you can see where uh, translators have made a decision about where certain sentences begin and end. Fun fact. So this is what he writes. Paul, we think, this is what we think he writes. A servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, the gospel concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh, and was declared to be son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by resurrection from the dead. Jesus Christ, our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith amongst all the Gentiles for the sake of his name, still going, including yourselves who are called to belong to Jesus Christ, to all God's beloved in Rome who are called to be saints, grace to you, Peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. If I got an email with that much of an introduction, I'd have a hard time reading past that. Paul, a servant, or actually more accurately translated from the Greek, a slave of Christ, set apart to be a called apostle. To whom? To Jesus Christ. And who is he? He is a descendant of King David the Son of God by virtue of the resurrection, through whom we are all called, yes, even you, Romans, called to belong to Jesus Christ. It's a fascinating way to start a letter. Here is who I am, which is only important because of Jesus and who he was and is, which actually leads to the truest nature of who you are. What a ride. Well, for those who paid attention past the introduction and salutation, Paul butters up his readers a little bit. He says, I thank God for you, because your faith is proclaimed throughout the world. Paul may never have been to Rome or joined a Roman Christian community, but he's heard about them, and he's hell-bent on getting to meet them in person. I remember you always in my prayers, asking that by God's will I may somehow at last succeed in coming to you. It's this next part that really stands out to me. Paul writes, for I am longing to see you, so that I may share with you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. Or rather, so that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. What uncharacteristic humility 
from Paul. And what a lesson for us today. Paul wants to visit the Christians in Rome not to correct or to lead or to teach or to make comparisons with other churches, but to learn, to grow in faith, to be encouraging and receive encouragement. Imagine if we had that posture of heart in our interactions today, whether with one another at church or another faith community or another group in the congregation. What if we approached our interactions with one another and the world around us with a heart wide open to hear and share and encourage one another rather than just trying to outsmart and outmaneuver? What if we genuinely hope to learn from one another, to love one another, to give and receive encouragement? A couple of weeks ago, we had our annual general meeting here at Knox. And while important work was done and important decisions were made, uh, good stewardship of finances, decision-making around ministry and trajectory for the year ahead, my favorite part of the AGM every year is what I have come to affectionately call the love fest. I think in the minutes it's called like moment of appreciation, but I like love fest better. It is a time set aside at the very end of the meeting to share words of gratitude for one another and the various ministries we have been a part of throughout the year. Hands shoot up, Uh, across the room, and whoever's tasked with carrying the microphone around, I think it was, Warren, it was you this year, yep, Uh, whoever's tasked with carrying the microphone around races from one person to the next as we gush about the amazing impact we make on one another, the congregation, the community, and the world. Gratitude for leading Bible studies, and mowing the lawn, and overseeing finances, and handwriting personal birthday cards. Thanksgiving for new outreach ministries, caring for the gardens, making beautiful music, removing barriers to worship through advancing technology, and caring about children, youth, and their families. The list goes on. It's a stunning display of love and encouragement and gratitude and praise to God for moving in and through the community of faith here at Knox Oakville. And while I understand, I get it, the meeting, bless you, I don't know, that's my job. Okay, Rachel, bless you. Um, While I understand that the AGM could be shortened by a solid 15 minutes or more, if we cut this part out, I think it's actually the lifeblood of our time together in that meeting. And churches are called to be many things but efficient is not one of them. Not only is it an opportunity to give thanks for what has happened, but it actually fuels us for what is to come. The Holy Spirit is palpable when we do our moment of appreciation, our love fest. How often do we stop in our daily lives to voice our appreciation of one another and the work of the kingdom that we participate in? In that moment, Church, we are not just names and faces in a directory or a database. We're not just the friendly face at the end of the pew. We're not cogs in some congregational machine. We're siblings in Christ, called, equipped, and sent out to participate in God's ongoing work of justice and reconciliation in the world. We rest in our full humanity as children of God in that moment. And what's crazy? I hear about it. And so many of you have as well from other sources outside of this place. Oh, Knox Oakville. I've heard about that congregation. They're a busy place. Oh, Knox Oakville. Yes, they're the church that kept their doors open for anonymous groups throughout the pandemic. Oh, Knox Oakville, yep, they've decided to stick with that hybrid thing and we'll be doing worship in person and on live stream in perpetuity. Oh, Knox Oakville, they've got that midweek dinner thing. Has that started up yet? A couple more, please. 
I thank God for you, Paul wrote to the Romans, because your faith is proclaimed throughout the world. So I want to come and see you, he says, to submerge myself in your communal life of faith and sharing and love and justice. Let's be mutually encouraged, Knox. Let us be mutually encouraged. You have been an encouragement to me. And I hope I have been to you. And you have been an encouragement to one another. In everything we do, let us love one another and, get, and give God thanks for one another. And let the word of our faith and witness and mission get around. Maybe somewhere out there, there is a Paul wanting to come to visit us too. And they will learn from us and we will learn from them. And in the spirit of God, we'll be mutually encouraged and the kingdom of God will grow. Being the church is actually as simple as that. Called, equipped, and sent. Loving one another and the world as God in Christ by the power of the Spirit has loved us. They will know we are Christians. Not by our programs, not by our doctrines, but by our love. And word will get around. And letters will be sent. And the kingdom of God will grow. And the world will be blessed as God seeks to reconcile this world that God so loves to himself. In the strong name of Jesus, we pray. To God be all the glory. Amen. Amen. Wrong one.